Um, uh, welcome, uh, Professor Fadul Kaboop, uh, into uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, let me introduce Professor Fadul Kaboop uh, to my audience uh, here. Professor Fadul Kaboop is a uh, professor of economics uh, in the Denison University. But he is very much known in the MMT community, he is one of the, uh, you know, I would say uh, premium figures to who has defined the MMT, MMT theory uh, that is making a wave in the economics, post Keynesian economics. I have invited Professor Fadul Kabuk to talk about uh, uh, Bangladesh's current economic predicament. Uh, I saw one of his lectures where he actually defined uh, the sequence uh, that a developing country go through to fall into an economic crisis. And I felt uh, Bangladesh has followed exactly the sequence that he laid out. And without knowing uh, about much about Bangladesh economy, um, his, his uh, sequence was actually very much relatable to me. So I contacted him and, and we are in some discussions and he is kind enough uh, to uh, provide a presentation on uh, the crises of uh, developing countries and also the question with that with the MMT and the and MMT insights uh, for Bangladesh. Just a few words about MMT. MMT means uh, modern monetary theory. It's a pretty new theory in post um, Keynesian economics. Um, I, I will not go much detail of it, but I would uh, request Professor Fadul Kau to give some insights to the audience who is not much aware of this. Okay, Professor uh, Fadul Kau, uh, the floor is to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, we'll uh, go ahead, turn off the uh, cameras so we can uh, see the presentation on full screen. Um, so uh, I'll preface this by saying I'm I'm not an expert on the on the Bangladeshi e economy, but one of the things uh, I've worked on for a, a number of years now is trying to detect the structural similarities that most countries in the global south uh, continue to struggle with, starting with the early post-colonial uh, days. And one of the things that uh, we notice is that it's, th these structures are very rigid and, and they essentially turn into economic traps. And the case of Bangladesh is, uh, is a case in point here. So uh, let's let's get started with with the basic idea here of looking at what is modern monetary theory, this framework that we're going to use as an analytical lens to understand what are these structural traps and and potentially how can we escape these potential uh, traps. So modern monetary theory emphasizes the concept of the spectrum of monetary sovereignty. In other words. Uh, different countries have a different degree of monetary sovereignty. You'll notice on one end of the spectrum, you could have countries with no monetary sovereignty whatsoever. Think of uh, the example of Ecuador, a country that dollarized its economy. It has no national currency um, versus countries that have a very high degree of monetary sovereignty, like the United States, like Japan, uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and so on. These are countries that enjoy a much larger degree of fiscal spending uh, space. Now, most developing countries are somewhere in between. The countries that are uh, experience severe crises are typically on the more limited end of uh, the degree of monetary sovereignty. And, and the goal of my research really is to think about how can we take a country with a very limited degree of monetary sovereignty and allow it to acquire via strategic policies a higher and higher degree of, of monetary sovereignty and economic sovereignty over time. So the traps that I talked about are the traps that keep you in this lower end of, of the spectrum. So to zoom in a little bit more about in, into what does it actually mean, uh, the, the degree of monetary sovereignty, this is what we're talking about. A country with a high degree of monetary sovereignty is a country that issues its own currency, and that's typically very easy. Number two, it's a country that collects taxes in the same national currency. That's also typically uh, not uncommon for countries to tax their economy in the national currency. But number three and four will become critical here. Number three, it's a country that only issues bonds denominated in the same national currency. So think of the entire Japanese debt stock is denominated in Japanese yen. 
Same thing for the US, it's denominated in US dollars. Developing countries and countries that have weak or low degrees of monetary sovereignty typically have both some debt in the national currency, but a lot of external debt denominated in dollars, euros, Japanese yen, and so on, foreign currencies. And number four is related to the third condition. And it's, it has to do with you know, countries with a high degree of monetary sovereignty doesn't really need to fix the value of its currency to the dollar or to the euro or to the British pound and so on. In other words, you don't have to have a fixed exchange rate policy. You can afford to have a flexible exchange rate or a floating exchange rate policy. And what I want to emphasize here about these four conditions that I'm describing here for a country with a high degree of monetary sovereignty I am not saying that a developing country with a low degree of monetary sovereignty can simply declare a high degree of monetary sovereignty by turning its exchange rate to a flexible exchange rate and, and defaulting on all of its external debt and doing nothing else structurally to acquire a high degree of monetary sovereignty. So it's not by decree, it's via strategic policies that can transition you on the higher end of that spectrum. And as a result, MMT creates a, a very clear distinction between a currency issuer versus a currency, the currency users. So the sovereign government is the issuer of the national currency. The rest of us in the system, individuals, businesses, nonprofits, foreign entities, were all users of that national currency. So the principles that we're used to, the sound finance principles that we're used to as individuals don't necessarily apply to the currency issue or the sovereign currency issue. So that's a very important thing. Don't try this at home. This is for sovereign governments and for public policies. So starting with the structural traps, most developing countries uh, have, you know, continuously struggled with what we call structural trade deficits that are um, deeply rooted, starting for most countries from the late 1960s, early 1970s. And these trade deficits create a scenario where external debt becomes increasingly burdensome on, on those countries and creates an external debt trap. And when you zoom in and look at the major root causes, you find typically three sectors or three structural deficiencies. One is energy deficits. Most developing countries are energy deficient. And that is true, by the way, even for big energy uh, exporters like Nigeria, for example, because they don't have the refining capacity for petroleum. Um, number two, food deficits. Most developing countries lack food sovereignty or have lost their food sovereignty over time. And number three, on the industrialization front, most developing countries tend to specialize in low value added manufacturing, either assembly line type of manufacturing or simply extractive industries where you're simply exporting raw materials. So these trade deficits, when they're structural, they tend to put downward pressure on the value of your currency relative to the dollar. So now with the weaker currency, everything you import the next morning is essentially more expensive. So you're literally importing inflation with that effect of currency depreciation. And that becomes really dangerous because everything you're importing, especially if you're importing basic necessities like food or fuel or medicine, you're importing higher food prices, higher fuel prices, higher medicine prices, and that creates the potential for social unrest um, unless food and fuel subsidies are introduced and maintained which forces the country to continue to borrow from foreign lenders. And that is essentially a Band-Aid solution because now your central bank is forced to borrow dollars and euros and British pounds in order to artificially sustain a fixed exchange rate with the strong currencies. Why artificially sustain a, a strong, artificially strong and fixed exchange rate? To prevent this inflation pass-through effect to prevent this structural trade deficit from causing the depreciation that forces you to buy food and fuel at higher and higher prices and 
hurting the most vulnerable uh, portion of your population, which is why we frequently see when when this system breaks down, you see social unrest related to uh, food riots and and, and inflation related uh, social and political uh, unrest, similar to what we're seeing in Sri Lanka and Tunisia and, and Lebanon and, and other parts of the world. Um, so zooming in on the composition of uh, of Bangladesh's exports and, and imports, when you just eyeball the composition of, uh, of, of the exports, and this is 2019, so it's pre-pandemic, uh, notice the number here, total volume of uh, exports is $44 billion, and notice the composition, it's essentially 90% of the economy is textiles very little diversity. And also when you're thinking textiles, it's a lot of foreign direct investment. So it's low cost labor to produce textiles for exports and profits are repatriated to the global north typically. Now I'm going to flip the page and look at the import composition in 2019. Notice the volume of imports. It's massively larger than, than the exports, so 67 billion compared to 44 billion. Uh, again, this is 2019 numbers. And notice the composition of imports. Not only it's much more diversified, uh, but also a huge block related to food uh, imports, a huge block related to energy, imports, a huge block related to high-tech and medical equipment and, and pharmaceuticals, uh, and a large block for raw material imports and intermediate uh, components that feed into the largest industry, which is the textile industry. That is typical of most developing countries that struggle with this high value added content of imports relative to the low value added content of exports. So it's not about accelerating your exports more, it's about changing the composition of exports so that over time you're climbing the value added ladder, so to speak, and you're exporting higher and higher value added content. In the case of Bangladesh, you can go back essentially decades and look at the composition. And if anything, it's gotten worse in terms of excessive specialization and low cost textile uh, production. Um, so these are typical uh, structural traps that developing countries have found it very difficult to, to escape from. So the, the mainstream solutions to the structural trade deficit that produces massive amount of external debt are, are the solutions that appear to be solutions, but effectively they're traps. So here's what we hear typically from an IMF policy proposal. Number one, austerity, reduce government involvement and encourage the private sector to pay for things, right? Balance the budgets, uh, debt restructuring, privatize state-owned enterprises. So you sell the water company, the electric company, the airport, the airline, um, provides you know a little bit of cash for governments in the short term, but you can't, once you privatize the airline, you can't privatize it again. So it's short-term solutions, but doesn't change the structure. Uh, this code word, labor market flexibility, in other words, uh, weaker labor unions or no labor unions, lower labor standards, lower wages, uh, freedom to hire and fire at will, essentially, um, it, it's, it doesn't really work very well when it comes to uh, protecting the most vulnerable workers, the most vulnerable members of society. Uh, foreign direct investment, FDI. We're told that this is going to be the thing to bring you know, foreign technology and foreign investment uh, to fuel job creation and economic growth even more than export-led growth. The thing is, if you specialize in low-value added manufacturing, not only is your export-led growth going to fail because you end up importing the energy, importing the capital, importing the technology, the know-how, the intermediate components, and then you use low-cost labor with very little value added for export. So with that structure, your export-led growth is always going to produce these negative terms of, grade, of trade. And your foreign direct investment is going to be very similar because foreign investors are coming in to take advantage of the same setup. You're offering them uh, low cost uh, 
maybe subsidized energy, subsidized labor, low cost labor to begin with, and they're looking for cheap assembly line factories uh, to, to use with the profits from those industries typically repatriated. So it turns out that FDI is actually more extractive than export-led growth proper because your, your domestic exporters are at least reinvesting their profits domestic, whereas FDI is typically repatriating profits. Uh, financial liberalization, in other words, set up a mini Wall Street to attract financial investments. Well, this has been an, an utter failure for the handful of developing countries that attempted this. They end up artificially creating a scenario to attract uh, speculators, financial speculators, and you have a little bit of a uh, stock market boom, followed by a crash, followed by a currency uh, crisis. As soon as these speculators who, who came in specifically to buy low and sell high, as soon as they make a profit, they leave and 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 leave a lot of damage behind them. So not not a solution. Tourism is often sold to us as one of the greatest strategies to uh, improve the situation because it allows you to create lots and lots of jobs and hotels and transportation and entertainment and, and restaurants and so on. But it also brings foreign currency reserves. Uh, so it appears to be a great solution, except the millions of tourists that you're bringing in, you have to feed them. So you end up importing more food that you don't have. And you have to transport them, heat and cool the hotels and import, you know, high quality entertainment equipment and things like that. So you end up importing even more energy and consuming more energy. Uh, so the net benefits of tourism ends up actually exacerbating the structural weaknesses we discussed earlier in terms of energy deficits and food deficits. Um, so it's not as great as what, what we're told. However, if a country has food sovereignty and energy sovereignty, then yes, tourism could become an engine of economic development and growth. But that's typically not the case for most uh, developing countries. Remittances. This is a huge uh, uh, issue for developing countries, for Bangladesh in, in particular. Remittances... Yes, you're bringing in dollars, but remember those dollars are coming in small increments. It's not like you're receiving billions of dollars of foreign direct investment or strategic investment. And they're typically going towards sustaining family members. So it's going towards consumption rather than structural investment. In addition to the brain drain effect that we typically observe with uh, with any large scale immigration that we see from, from the global south. Uh, so we end up with a race to the bottom, we end up with more external debt, and we end up with these vicious cycles uh, that most developing countries have experienced since the 70s. We went into the mid-1980s debt crisis, followed by the neoliberal reforms of the 90s and the 2000s, and, and now we're back into a cycle of, of debt crises uh, exacerbated by, by COVID, by the conflict in the Ukraine, uh, and, and to some extent by, by climate change. So we're told that there is no alternative. This is the, the famous Margaret Thatcher phrase. And, and what I'm describing here is that these are actually traps. Every single one of these so-called solutions uh, create uh, a trap for developing countries that forces us into more austerity and, and more of the same policies. So the question becomes, how do we escape these structural traps? Can we afford structural transformation in the global south and who's going to pay for it? This is where the MMT insights come in, in terms of helping us identify how much spending capacity does a country like Bangladesh or Tunisia or Egypt has in domestic national currency, not with external borrowing. How much spending capacity can we safely introduce without causing inflation, without bankrupting the country? That is really the, the fundamental question. So, we're typically told that a government can safely spend up to the point where it collects taxes to pay for that spending, and to some extent up to the point where the market, which is supposed to discipline government spending here, where the market will allow you to borrow. So beyond that, we're told that's it. The government can't really spend more and, and can't have a large deficit that's not paid for by taxes or borrowing in the, in the short term. What MMT is telling us is that there's this large uh, 
additional spending capacity, that bright yellow space. That's not infinite. Notice it's constrained. It's limited by what we call the inflation risk. So for MMT, modern monetary theory, the question is, how do we pin down where that inflation risk is? And number two, are we able to introduce strategic policies that can expand that additional spending capacity, that bright yellow space? In other words, push the risk of inflation further and further out. What are those strategies that allow us to spend more without bankrupting the country, without causing inflation? So the real limit to government spending is the risk of inflation. And for MMT, the risk of inflation is determined by two things. Number one, the lack of productive capacity or logistics or supply chain disruptions. In other words, do we have the real resources, including skills and know-how and materials and infrastructure and supply chain logistics uh, to produce more? If we can, then additional spending by the government, which will induce additional consumer demand, will not cause inflation. But if we're limited in terms of availability of physical productive capacity and the government spends more and demand increases, then we will have more inflation. So as long as we spend strategically to increase productive capacity in key areas of the economy and improve logistics and supply chains and, and labor productivity, then the additional government deficit spending is not going to be inflationary. As a matter of fact, it can be targeted to reduce the inflation pressure points in the economy. Number two that causes inflation is the abusive market power of price setters in the system. In other words, when you have monopolies or cartels or individual um, you know, uh, companies, or in some cases, individuals running companies who are so powerful and so dominant, they can simply raise prices because they can because the market is not competitive enough, because we're not implementing antitrust regulations, anti-monopoly regulations. So from an MMT perspective, expanding that additional spending capacity, that bright yellow space, has to do with tackling number one and number two here, which is spend strategically to increase productive capacity in key areas of the economy, and number two, tax and regulate abusive market power out of existence. So it turns out fighting inflation from an MMT perspective can be done with more spending, not less spending. Uh, whereas the mainstream approach, you know, usually recommends austerity and there's no alternative to austerity. So this is very counterintuitive for a lot of people. What do you mean fighting inflation with, with more spending? That is the paradigm shift type of framework that we're introducing here. But let's pursue that question a little bit more. Increase government spending to fight inflation. This doesn't make any sense in the traditional kind of mainstream approach to economics. But here's why. Here's the logic. Let's look at scenario number one from a mainstream perspective. If Bangladesh today decides to spend uh, 50 billion taka on health and education, let's say. For, for example, I'm just making up this hypothetical example. Here's what the mainstream approach tells you will happen. And here's why they'll say you should not do this. So number one, you're going to have more imports of food, energy, medical equipment, because there's more government spending in the economy on these uh, items. Uh, then you're going to have a large trade deficit, even larger than before a weaker currency, a weaker exchange rate. You can have this inflation pass-through effect or even hyperinflation if you spend too much continuously. So you're gonna end up with more external debt. The IMF and other foreign lenders will mandate spending cuts, in other words, austerity. And you're gonna have less investment in health and education. So we're back to square one with now more unemployment, more brain drain, more social, economic, and political tensions. And essentially, you will be convinced by this approach that there is no alternative. See, we told you you shouldn't do that. That's essentially what Margaret Thatcher told us a long time ago. There is no alternative. Here's scenario number two, the MMT scenario. And notice here I'm using the exact same amount of spending, 50 billion taka, except now it will be spent in a slightly different way. So the MMT approach, what if we now spend 25 billion taka on health and education, 
instead of the 50 from the previous slide, plus 25 billion, sorry, here I have uh, the Tunisian currency inside, instead, this should say Taka, 25 billion Taka on increasing domestic productive capacity of food, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and crack down on corruption, abusive price uh, setting behavior, importers of luxury goods via taxation and regulation. If you do this, then here's what's going to happen. You're going to have fewer imports of food and energy because you're producing more uh, food domestically and more renewable energy domestically. You're going to have lower trade deficit, which means a stable or even stronger exchange rate. You're going to have no inflation pass through effect because you don't have that pressure on your exchange rate. You're going to have lower external debt and higher credit ratings over time. And as a result, you're going to in, you're going to have an increase in foreign currency reserves at the central bank, and you're going to have more resilience to these external shocks related to food and energy security. You're going to have a lower carbon footprint and more jobs, less brain drain, and improved quality of life for all. Now we're talking, because then the question becomes, is the real limit for Bangladesh in this hypothetical scenario, is that 50 billion takas? Maybe it is 60. Maybe it's 80, maybe it's 100. What really determines how large of a deficit we can spend are going to be the availability of skilled labor, trained labor, productive capacity in terms of equipment and administrative capacity of the government and its agencies to actually administer 50 billion taka worth of spending, the administrative capacity to tackle corruption and abuse and to audit the system and regulate the system in a consistent way. Uh, so the limit turns out to be more on the real resource side rather than a financial uh, uh, numerical um, uh, value that we must abide by in order to balance the budget and remain within the austerity framework. So that's really kind of a, a quick hypothetical example. And then finally, I want to emphasize a very important component in terms of escaping the structural traps on the manufacturing and industrial side, the importance of South-South strategic partnerships, because this is where countries in the global South need to coordinate efforts to escape collectively. It's not sufficient. It's, it's much harder for a single country, country to escape by, by itself from these structural traps. And, and it's for the following reasons. Number one, you want to have access to larger markets, which allows you to hit those economies of scale. For small developing countries like my country, Tunisia, uh, with 11 or 12 million consumers, you can't really industrialize and hit the, the manufacturing economies of scale that you need to lower the cost per unit when your domestic market only has 11 million consumers. You just oversaturate your market. So you need a, an outlet for your output. And typically it's been done via exports, except it's really hard to compete with made in Germany, made in Japan, made in uh, USA technology on, on any front. So you end up not being able to compete and you end up doing the assembly line type of work. Here with strategic partnerships, take a block of 20, 30 uh, countries in the global South forming an internal kind of uh, trade, uh, strategic trade partnership where now you have access to 400 million consumers instead of 10 or 11 million consumers. So now you can industrialize because you have access to an internal market within that trading block of 20 or 30, um, uh, 30 uh, countries. Uh, you emphasize the importance of complementarity of resources and capabilities. What if those 20 or 30 countries in the strategic trading block happen to have all the raw materials and capabilities, human capabilities, know-how capabilities to develop a renewable energy manufacturing uh, industrial complex for the trading block. Now you can industrialize while at the same time deploying renewable energy capacity for the entire trading block without having to import uh, 
the solar panels or wind turbines. Maybe you'll need strategic partnership on the technology front, say with Germany or the US or China. That is doesn't mean a strategic partnership in the global south will completely exclude the rest of the world. You can still partner, but now you partner on your own terms for your own benefits, not in a neo-colonial extractive uh, trade relationship, which is typically what we have um, experienced in the last 40 plus years. Um, focus on horizontal linkages to increase the, these horizontal links between industries within the trading block so that you increase the value added content and retain the value added content within your industrial system, as opposed to import all the components and simply use low cost labor and, and produce very low value added content for, for export. So that's really, these are the pillars for this strategic partnership. And then you focus on collective resilience, starting with food sovereignty, renewable energy sovereignty, water security, education, training, healthcare, transportation. Start with the building blocks of a resilient economy. And you can't really have any functioning economy anywhere in the world without food, without energy. Um, so these are the first pillars. You don't start by saying we're going to prioritize export-oriented growth to serve the needs of the global supply chains as determined by multinational corporations in, in Europe or the United States. That, that's, that's a non-starter. So you have to start focusing on the collective resilience of the trading block with the complementarity of resources and capabilities, uh, starting again with food and energy sovereignty. So for me, this is how a country acquires a higher degree of economic and monetary sovereignty over time. As I said in the beginning, you, you don't declare your monetary sovereignty, you acquire it, you earn it with strategic investments in the way I described here uh, briefly. And if a country or regional trading bloc lacks this basic level of resilience, it has no bargaining chips. You can't really walk away from any negotiation table, whether it's trade negotiations or anything else, and it will continue to lose its economic and monetary sovereignty uh, over time. So with that, I'm, I'm happy to answer uh, questions. Uh, I, I know this was very brief, but it's meant to be the kind of the starting point of a, of a conversation, this, this paradigm shift to use a different lens, analytical lens to think about uh, these these questions. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thanks, uh, Professor Kaboob. Uh, my key takeaway from uh, your uh, discussion is uh, how you defined how uh, the developing countries has uh, need to have uh, the uh, energy sovereignty, food sovereignty, and also the mismatch uh, between uh, value-added content and important export. I'm not much into MMT, so uh, that's not something uh, I'm, personally, I'm, I'm not focusing a lot, but I see how those three elements can is working for a country like Bangladesh. Um, I have a couple of questions. My first question is that when you say that uh, even due to the low value-added content, uh, in exports, uh, the, the uh, mismatch is created. But if we look at particularly Bangladesh's history, um, then we can see that a country actually grows from low value added content to higher value added content. content. For example, our garment industry started with very low value added content. Now it is around 50% to 60% value added content. So my question is that if we look at countries which have focused on internal consumption-based industries, countries in South America, they have actually also not done very well. Um, practically, the countries that have focused on external um, side, they have actually done better. So my question is here, what, then what is for a country like Bangladesh, which uh, is focusing on RMG, which has uh, a very single item exposure to uh, the exports, but it's still in the middle of valuated content, but we haven't developed other capacities. So what can, what is the solution for countries like Bangladesh? Very good question. So uh, I don't want to mention brand names here or, or anything, but essentially when you look at the, 
the the textile uh, industry there is the the production side a lot of it happens in in bangladesh and other countries in the global south but then there is the other side of the business which is the marketing and distribution and design and a whole other multiple layers in that ladder of value added that's that remains the most lucrative side of the business that most countries in the global south have been completely excluded from it right which is where most of the wealth most of the money in the industry comes from uh, similar things related to i i come from tunisia and, and a big export in tunisia is uh, olives and olive oil uh, except we happen to be one of the largest producers of the crop but who makes most of the money it's the Italian and Spanish companies that dominate the global distribution uh, and, and, and marketing uh, of the final product to the final consumers. That's where the money is. So breaking into the different layers of the, of the uh, global supply chain, that's where we're locked into that trap of producing the raw material or assembling the raw material. So yes, you can have a little bit higher value added content on the manufacturing side, but you're still not reaping the full benefits of an industry, right? So uh, we can talk about successful examples of countries that broke out of that cycle. And it wasn't by chance or by accident, it was by design. Um, think of the South Korean example, think about Singapore, uh, just to, to mention a few. These are countries that did have very similar import substitution industrialization policies in the 1950s and, and 60s, but they did it in a way that started with protecting the these infant industries and subsidizing them, but with strings attached. In other words, saying for every manufacturing unit and every manager of manufacturing unit, you have to meet certain performance criteria on a regular schedule. Otherwise you lose your benefits. Otherwise you're stealing from the country and you're putting us at risk of, of economic collapse eventually because the goal was to improve productivity, improve value added, improve customer service and quality and competitiveness on the price level so that you're able to compete with global producers, not just global assembly line producers, so that you're able to compete with other major dominant industries, compete directly going to the final consumer in the global north. And that is where countries like South Korea in particular was able to achieve that, but with strategic policies implemented and enforced by uh, industrial planning by the government under harsh punishments in, in many cases. Um, so it, this this wasn't kind of something that the market created uh, via kind of incentives and indirect subsidies and things like that. Uh, so the question for us today, are we going to go back to the 1950s and start all over again? It's It's kind of too late. So that's why you know, in this day and age, 2022, with all the major challenges we face on the climate front, on the uh, global inequality front, and on the inflation front, we have to uh, produce a coherent global South framework for a different kind of industrialization that prioritizes escaping from these structural traps. Right, I get you. Um, let's get to Sri Lanka. Okay, and one of the core theme I would say from your talk that I find in all of your talks is that you 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 identify that the limits of government spending is inflation, and but for countries it is not very easy to understand or define how much uh, new money printing or how much uh, fiscal expansion or monetary expansion will lead to how much inflation. It is not something Sri Lanka had planned for. I have seen uh, Sri Lankan central governments, um, uh, central banks, uh, I th um, different talks is saying that, well, the connection between the inflation and money supply has been broken. It is not as clear as before. And then they resorted to uh, money printing and then um, uh, they had used MT as a justification. And I have also seen your article uh, 
where you said that no Sri Lanka didn't follow MMT. But it, let's put us in the in the place of Sri Lankan central uh, central bank's governance place, where mm -hmm. he need to. I mean, it's it's not a scenario where someone is deciding how much flexibility they have, rather they, they have to spend, they do not have any other way. And then they resort to MMT with the same logic of, okay, we do not know how much inflation is going to trigger. So how do you explain that? And what's your overall take on Sri Lanka? Uh, very good question. So uh, you mentioned, I, I wrote that piece, the response to the, the criticism that Sri Lanka was somehow following MMT insights, and that's what led to the crisis. And one of the things I, I want to start this, uh, this answer with is, if you look at Sri Lanka's um, uh, relationship with the IMF, with the standard mainstream economic policies that I described here. Sri Lanka has been almost continuously under an IMF program since the late 1960s. 16 consecutive IMF programs with the policies prescribed by the IMF, and now they're entering the 17th um, IMF program as as we speak. So to, to claim that somehow Sri Lanka was following MMT uh, policy recommendations is, is nonsensical. They've been following mainstream uh, policy prescriptions dictated by the IMF to the letter, including during the, the lead up to the, the Sri Lanka crisis. They were actually under an IMF program during that cycle. Now their, their central banker, was using uh, you know MMT as a as a convenient cover for the failed policies uh, to claim that well MMT told us that uh, we don't uh, uh, all we have to do is just reduce the the proportion of the external debt that we have yeah but how do you do it by declaring it or by actually introducing strategic policies that reduce Sri Lanka's uh, reliance on imported fuel or imported food or imported uh, uh, petrochemicals. Uh, so obviously, this this was a, 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 a massive failure of the Sri Lankan government, and lots of corruption, by the way, leading to this. And all the MMT insights that I prescribed that I described today uh, focus on identifying the risk of inflation where it comes from. In the case of Sri Lanka, it's huge amounts of energy imports, huge amounts of food imports, and over the years, thanks to IMF recommendations, increasingly more reliance on tourism, increasingly more reliance on, on brain drain, on remittances, increasingly more reliance on extractive FDI investments, low value added content manufacturing. So these are, uh, these are really the things that led to this external debt uh, uh, explosion. Of course, the COVID crisis made it worse. The conflict in the Ukraine made things worse with global energy prices. But those are not the roots of the problem. Those are just kind of uh, the, the, the elements that exacerbated already pre-existing uh, failures. Right. I actually have two understanding based on what you're saying. For me, countries like Sri Lanka or countries like Bangladesh, I would say if we follow the MMT prescription, we actually have less fiscal space because we have a higher inflation. Right now we have a higher inflation, but the government continues to justify its spending by saying, okay, I have a, we have done a very high GDP, which is a very manufactured number. And then they show, okay, I have five, I'm just maintaining 5%, we are just maintaining 5% deficit. And that means we can uh, we have this um, this amount of uh, fiscal and monetary uh, um, uh, capacity. Whereas since the inflation has triggered, whereas as per my understanding, based on what you have said, countries like Bangladesh or Sri Lanka doesn't have that fiscal space. Yeah, I mean governments who speak the language of fiscal policy space, they usually don't think of it from an MMT perspective with an inflation constraint. They think of it in terms of deficit as a percentage of GDP or debt to GDP ratios, which is the, the mainstream metric. The, the MMT metric for where the actual limit of government deficit is has to do with what you're spending on. Not all government deficits are equally inflationary. You can actually have a small deficit causing higher inflation. I'll give you a, an example. If your deficit spending is going to fuel an increase in demand for housing, for example, 
hypothetically. And it happens to be that housing is one of the key inflation pressure points that you already have in the economy. So you increase deficit spending, all of a sudden demand for housing increases and you have housing shortage. So what happens to rent prices and, and home prices? It goes through the roof and it feeds into an inflation cycle. Same thing with food, same thing with energy or medical care, whatever, whatever the item is. So what you need to do before you increase your deficit is ask yourself, can we anticipate where the additional demand in the economy is going to take place? There's going to be, you know, 3% increase in housing demand, 5% increase in energy demand, 10% increase in food consumption, meat versus dairy versus uh, other items. And then you can anticipate, do we actually have the productive capacity to meet this new demand? If not, it's going to translate into imports and imports is going to add to your structural trade deficit, and it's going to weaken your currency. And as a result, you're going to have an inflation pass through effect. So these are the questions you ask yourself before you even engage in deficit spending. And as a result, that exercise will dictate what kind of strategic policies you need to put in place in order to build protection or resilience to those inflation pressure points. And that's why I translate a lot of my work here in terms of a lot of the priorities that developing countries have to prioritize in terms of public investment, strategic investment, is boosting food sovereignty, boosting renewable energy sovereignty, so that you minimize these big pressure points that usually are imported. And then restructure your industries over long term. You're not going to restructure the Bangladeshi textile industry in one year or five years or 10 years. You have to have a 20, 30 year strategic industrial plan with strategic partnerships on the technology front, on the market access front, on the supply chain front, on the labor productivity front, in order to move up the ladder and diversify and do it in a, in a just way that doesn't throw workers under the bus, but transitions workers in higher value added manufacturing, different kinds of uh, aspects. And again, you're not going to be able to do it easily by yourself. It's much easier to partner with other countries who are struggling to escape from the same traps. Now, let's get back to the issue of value addition. Like what the reason countries like Bangladesh or many countries take up export oriented growth, export oriented model is because even at lesser value addition, it creates employment. And when it creates employment, it's this uh, same old plot. The employment generates savings. The savings can generate more investment. And then investment can slowly multiply. And then country can, um, you know, take up a, a path where uh, more internal consumption and then more internal consumption fuels more internal uh, investment. Now, what? What we are saying here, I mean, I'm, I'm being a little blunt here, uh, ignoring the question of monetary and food sovereignty. If countries like Bangladesh focuses too much of that value addition issue, that there we ignore the uh, industries which is low value addition. And I give a very particular example. Right at this moment, Bangladesh is doing mobile phone manufacturing industry very little value addition, only 2% value addition comes from uh, local uh, uh, employment. Uh, but most of the things are basically assembling and then uh, selling into market. But we say, we think, oh, we have made this product, but it's only 2% value addition. But even if it is that, it is 2% value addition. And I see no chance Bangladesh, even Samsung is doing manufacturing entity here, basically assembly line. I do not see that uh, in terms of the gap in knowledge, uh, the uh, gap and the complexity of knowledge complexity can be, uh, you know, eased so easily. Mm -hmm. I do not see that Bangladesh ever becoming a um, hub for manufacturing mobile. But still, it, with the low value addition of even 2%, we have 25,000 or, for example, 100,000 jobs being created. So what should take on that? It's a very low value addition, but still it is value addition. Yeah, and, in, and and that's part of the reason why countries remain trapped because any foreign direct investment, assembly line manufacturing like you describe here is, is considered a relief because you're employing thousands of people, you're supporting thousands of family, and it's a little bit of value added addition. 
but long term, it is a trap because number one, it structurally traps your economy into assembly line manufacturing. Number two, it's a trap because in order to attract more of that type of manufacturing, you continuously have to offer uh, tax cuts and incentives to foreign direct investors. And you have to import the energy to fuel the manufacturing. You have to subsidize the cost of living for workers in those manufacturing units so that there the cost of wages in your country remain competitive compared to your neighbors who are also trying to do the same thing. They're trying to attract the same companies with low cost labor and tax incentives and subsidies in order to create the 100,000 jobs in their country as opposed to in, in your country. So this is the race to the bottom scenario. When you look at it in an isolated, from an isolated standpoint, just one country perspective, it's better than nothing, agreed. But long term, it's a trap for you and all of your neighbors. That's why on the on the on the industrial strategy part, it's very important for a block of countries to look at each other and realize what are we doing to ourselves here? Is there a way we can um, bundle up our resources and have a better bargaining position with? Uh, strategic partners in the global south, on the global north, on the technology front, and then use our resources and capabilities in the global south to escape this but trap. Is that not too utopian thinking that countries in global north will come together and will create its own market and then um, do these things? Is I, that I don't. I don't utopian? think. And then, I don't think it's utopian. Uh, I'm I'm being very uh, realistic here. I'm, I'm not saying this is easy or this can be done without uh, issues, but uh, I'll give you a similar utopian example that actually happened on, on this strategic partnership between a number of countries. When the European countries were trying to figure out a way to compete with Boeing, right? They created Airbus. Airbus was not created by France or Germany or England. There's no way any one of those individual countries would have been able to compete with Boeing. Um, but as a, as a block, as a strategic block, they were able to coordinate resources and capabilities to effectively compete with, with Boeing. Now, I'm not saying countries in the global south need to jump in and start competing with Boeing and Airbus, but that's how you tackle major almost impossible, you know, transitions to compete with an existing uh, economic um, entity like, like Boeing in this case. Oh, again, we don't have to start competing with Boeing and Airbus. We need to start coordinating so that we shift our manufacturing base from uh, a situation where we're simply supplying the global north with whatever the global north needs to a situation where we look inwards and say, one of our big, biggest strategic weaknesses, deficiencies, is lack of energy. So how about we build manufacturing units that prioritize the production and the development and deployment of renewable energy infrastructure for this block of 30 countries? We have all the resources. We have the manufacturing potential to create industries at scale to boost economic development for the next 30 years. That's what I'm talking about. And of course, it requires political coordination between those countries. But what I'm trying to suggest with this uh, approach is that we have to start somewhere and we have to think long-term. Right. If those 30 countries that I'm hypothetically talking about here, if each one of those countries doesn't have a strategic vision for itself and its partners for the next 50 years, it's going to be part of somebody else's plan. And guess who else that's somebody else? <laughs> it's it's China, it's the US, it's the EU, it's uh, you know Japan. These are the countries that have long-term strategic plans with assigned positions for each one of the small developing countries to play a role in that global framework. Right. Let me just go a little back to that uh, discussion of value addition. I mean, I, I was giving the example of mobile phone industry, the national mobile phone industry in Bangladesh, and I, I told you that it's only 2% uh, local manufacturing value addition. Now, um, the situation is this, that it's, and you identified rightly that it is a trap, but let's look at the alternative. The alternative is pure importing with zero value addition. Mm 
So when we compare, and if you look at uh, the discussion that you have been doing, that there is a mismatch between the value addition between uh, imports and the exports. But if it only, if Bangladesh only imports a mobile phone, instead of this 2% value addition, it loses 2% more. So what's your take on that? Uh, sure. I mean, these are these are trade-offs that countries have to, have to make on, uh, not just in terms of manufacturing, but what if the substitute for that 2% value added manufacturing or assembly line of cell phones changes into an industrial base that produces renewable energy infrastructure for the country that will close a big the, the hope is this the hope is this that okay today we are doing 2% but I'm, i mean they have, Bangladesh have done that in motorcycle industry not very successfully but with limited success uh -huh. first uh, it allowed uh, companies to set up motorcycles for local market mm -hmm. um, and they gave a duty structure of maybe 80% or 85% um, foreign valuation is enough but slowly they increased and then they said no now you have to do a little bit more now so and then slowly 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 they increased so to begin with with this very little value addition, it's uh, countries like Bangladesh with very less technology and very less uh, knowledge capacity has no other way to start with very less value addition. So if if you want to stick with, with the example of um, value added content for, for cell phone manufacturing, long term, the only way to increase that is to start investing in education, infrastructure, technical skills, research and development potentially, so that you qualify for the higher end portions of producing or manufacturing cell phones. So the question is, how do we get our workforce in the next 20 to 30 years to climb the ladder of skills so that we start attracting different units of manufacturing that accumulate that higher value added content. So now we're back to the question of education and technical trains and technical training and so on. You're not gonna have that level of commitment to education and technical training if you're stuck in a debt trap with IMF conditionalities forcing you to reduce government spending on education and infrastructure and health and relying on the private sector to do more of it. So this is what, this is what I mean, that's why prioritizing the big foundational blocks of food and energy, renewable energy, and making that as part of your industrial policy is a much smarter way to move long-term so that the next block in your foundation becomes education and technical training and health. So you don't have to depend on the market or uh, the private sector deciding how much investment in education is allowed in a particular country. And if that is always gonna be a constraint, there's no way for a country to escape the low value added manufacturing. I mean, how did Singapore escape that? Not with market incentives to invest in education and technical training. It was government commitment to raising the standard of um, uh, education uh, and technical uh, skills for the entire population, workforce uh, in, in, in high end and service jobs and manufacturing jobs and, and technical skills so that you become more selective in the types of industries you attract to, to the country. Thank you. I think that makes sense. I, I think that rounds up uh, this question is that it is not about uh, countries uh, having entering into industry which has low value addition, rather it's about countries entering into um, in investment and industries where they can see that they can increase the value addition in future and they invest strategically on the education and building the infrastructure and the research so that that uh, capacity increases. So a country just blindly invest thinking, okay, I'm going to get into manufacturing now, but instead of focusing on uh, this uh, education and research infrastructure is going to get stuck into what you identified is the energy sovereignty issue and then valuated mismatch issue. Yeah, right. uh, that makes perfect, perfect sense. So uh, Professor Kabu, thank you very much for your time. And it has been a, a, a actually great insight. I mean, I told you a number of times before, actually, 
I get something very different from your lecture. It's somewhere where you identified the sequence of how the developing countries falls into trap. Uh, this uh, and for me, that's where I found that okay, this is exactly what happened in Bangladesh, and the mainstream economics uh, economist has not identified that, but you have laid out the sequence, which has been replicated in Bangladesh. Uh, I mean, uh, not a good thing. <laughs> but now I can see the pattern, how it's working. And then the idea of uh, monetary sovereignty and also energy sovereignty and food sovereignty makes absolutely perfect sense. Uh, it's something, this MMT insights are not very much discussed into Bangladesh. It's, uh, uh, I hope uh, the people who will be watching this uh, show, they will pick up and they will get these ideas and they will, also now take those ideas into mainstream thinking and we'll apply those to correct where the mainstream is obviously going wrong. So thank, thank you, you very much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay then. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs>